So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today as the co-chair of the Workforce Development Committee. Uh, my name is Shauna Argue, and I'm the Director of Registration with the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Saskatchewan. And uh, with me today is my uh, uh, public sector co-chair, Senator Marilyn Chase from the state of Washington. So this is, I don't know how many times we've done this together now, Marilyn, but I think we're getting it down Years. to the, yeah. <laughs> Great, well thank you and welcome everyone. Um, you had a, an agenda that was in the, the program booklet that was uh, given to you when you had the registration. I think it might also be on the handouts on your table. Um, you'll note that we're short a panelist, so the good news is the rest of the panelists have more time to speak. Uh, we do have um, a couple of uh, sections that we're going to go through, and, but before we get there, I just wanted to give you a quick update. Most of you are aware that the engineering professions in Canada have been um, working with some of our partners in the U.S. and on, on a comedy of licensure file. We've had comedy of licensure with Idaho for several years now and it's been a very successful partnership. Um, Colin Smith from Engineers Geoscientists BC and I have been continuing to work that file and we're hoping to have an agreement in Oregon um, by the time we see you next year in Saskatoon and then we'll move on to uh, Washington and Montana. So um, within the next three or four years, we're hoping that we'll have everybody on board with the comedy of licensure. And this is a pilot project that pinware has been working on uh, with professional licensure that we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to transfer that into other professions as well in the future. So with that, I'm going to pass um, on to Senator Chase to introduce our session for today. I'm going to be the rapid note taker and uh, hopefully we'll have a good dialogue with our speakers. I know um, we've had some very, very good uh, conference calls leading up to this uh, session on our planning of the of the group, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion, um, especially on the automation and everything. Being an engineer, an industrial engineer to boot, very excited. So, Marilyn, are we going to do the movie? Um, I'm not sure. Hmm? Who had the movie? Did, did you guys get it hooked up? I don't know about that. There should be a movie in hmm? that starts. The we were going we were going to start with it. Okay. Yeah. We have a little treat for you from the Council on Foreign Relations on their take on the future of work. Here's a question for you. Remember when the future seemed to be a place with flying cars and robots and people traveling through space? Back then, technology meant promise and potential. Americans were much more optimistic about the role it would play in their daily lives. Fast forward to today, and that optimism seems to be vanishing. Robots had been fully integrated into our imagination. Now they're finally here. But instead of serving us, we find them competing for our jobs. Reports of automation, artificial intelligence, and self-driving vehicles replacing human workers are everywhere. Even with near record low unemployment, Americans are more and more concerned about losing their jobs because of new technologies. Jobs in manufacturing, in the service sector, and in retail are especially vulnerable. Here's one example straight from the headlines. Nearly three million Americans drive trucks for a living. If self-driving technology develops at its current pace, these jobs could vanish in the next 10 to 15 years. In addition, accountants, doctors, and lawyers were once thought to be impervious to disruption. But even these better paying professions could be redefined with massive shifts in how work is done. Technological disruption has come as wages have stagnated for decades, income inequality has increased, and the middle class has shrunk. So how can the United States prepare for this disruption and build new opportunities for its workers? The past might offer some answers. More than 100 years ago, during the height of the Industrial Revolution, new technologies gave rise to new ways of working. Technologies like electricity, the steam engine, the telephone, and the automobile all required different skills from American workers. The United States responded by expanding free public education and training opportunities, far outpacing any other country. In just 30 years, the number of school-aged children attending high school skyrocketed from 18 to 73 percent, and those completing their schooling went from 9 to 51 percent. The link between education and good jobs is even clearer today. Most jobs created by retiring baby boomers require advanced degrees or specialized training. 
Yet more than half of all Americans have only a high school education or less. That means even more good jobs are at risk of going unfilled. So what can be done? The first step is to see education and work as closely linked. Almost half of U.S. companies complain that too few graduates leave school with the skills they need to enter the workforce. For younger students, this means a greater focus on work-study programs, early job-oriented counseling, internships, apprenticeships, and career-related coursework. Companies, educational institutions, and government should help support programs that allow workers to learn new skills at every stage of their careers. So that's how workers get trained for the future. But how do we ensure that those who have acquired skills get jobs? Unfortunately, the United States has a big matching problem. Sometimes this means there aren't enough workers where jobs are being created. For example, the Rust Belt might lose manufacturing jobs while Silicon Valley is booming. Here too, we can look to the past. In the 1950s and 60s, Americans were the most mobile people in the world. When jobs were scarce in one part of the country, they would move to where jobs were more plentiful. That doesn't happen as much today. One culprit is that booming urban areas lack affordable housing and public transportation to get people to where the jobs are located. Another major obstacle is excessive state and local credentialing and licensing requirements. For example, the country's three million teachers must have state-issued licenses in order to work in school systems. Yet most states don't recognize licenses issued by other states. It's not just teachers. Bartenders, interior decorators, cosmetologists, manicurists, and even florists typically require some sort of state license that's not recognized across state lines. Sometimes the matching problem means employers demand college degrees for jobs that don't require them, or overlook good applicants who lack work experience. Here we can look to the future. Big data will empower employers to use more precise job matching behind the scenes. And to share credential requirements, it can also help applicants showcase their abilities to the largest number of companies. This all sounds pretty good, but what else is needed to create more opportunities for the American workforce? Federal, state, and local governments should provide better services for workers transitioning from one job to another. Things like skills retraining and job counseling are crucial. And will be even more essential for those working in ways unimaginable to previous generations. The United States currently provides just a small fraction of what most European countries do to help workers who lose their jobs retrain for new careers. In addition, support systems such as healthcare, sick leave, family leave, and retirement benefits are generally only available to full-time workers. Low-wage, part-time, and independent contractors are making up a larger and larger share of the U.S. workforce. These employment benefits could be tied to the worker rather than to the job throughout their careers. Education, retraining, mobility, and support systems might sound like tall orders for the country, but remember, the United States has overcome large challenges in the past. We need to do it again. Nothing less than the future of the U.S. workforce depends on it. Okay. Well, that's one one view of what the future looks like. You know, we're very pleased to have everyone here, so we can talk about this from from different perspectives. You know, the the uh, Pew Research Center found that 72% of all Americans are worried about robots taking over their jobs, but only 2% has 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 indicated any threat 
and, um, and from actually having lost a job to the robots. So, but we do know that automation is, is inf impacting us throughout and it's felt throughout the economy. And some say that the Great Recession of 08 slowed down the process a bit. Um, it, showed, it slowed demand. It uh, also gave firms a chance to retool and it also gave them an excuse to lay off unproductive workers. We'll see. Um, but our main concern for, for the, the residents, I think both of the United States and Canada, is are computers going to replace us or augment us? It's a big question. Uh, we're also going to hear about our DQ. Instead of IQ, we're going to hear about DQ. And that's the uh, digital intelligence. You know, and, it, and it has a sum of social, emotional, and cognitive abilities that enable individuals to face the challenges and adapt to the demands of a digital life. And I know, having watched my grandson grow up with computers, that it's just second nature to him. You know, he's, he moves easily from, from just about every program on the computer that you could find um, into gaming and talking to machines and the like, although I do admit that I'm now talking to my phone, Siri. And so I'm, I'm just, I do the same thing too. But these are the things that, that, that are going to face us. So we, today we hope we have some wonderful experts to give us their take on what faces us when we deal with workforce and the needs of the economy for trained workers, for adaptability, and for cooperation. Our first speaker is going to be Nirav Desai. Is that, am I saying your last Desai. name? Right? Desai. Desai. Yep. Okay, we'll get there. Um, besides being a brilliant man, he's also a brilliant uh, entrepreneur, an investor, and a strategist uh, who integrates technologies to enable the next wave of computing. So it's a very timely uh, subject for us, and you have on your table um, our bios for our speakers. So I'm not going to take any more time in going over them, uh, and I'm sure that if anybody has a question on anyone, any of the speakers, about their bi bios, we can ask them. But in the meantime, I'd ask you, Naraf, to come, to the, come up here and regale us. Thank you, Senator Chase. Thank you, Shauna. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about uh, how uh, probably more of a technology focus uh, than some of the other presentations. Um, more looking at um, the roadmap of technology that I see and how that's going to affect um, uh, the jobs of tomorrow. Um, real quick, my bio, I I'm, I'm, uh, spent 14 years with uh, Booth Allen Hamilton looking at um, way uh, how um, from a, a broader perspective on how government research, corporate research connects back with um, uh, the, uh, the uh, innovation ecosystem, startups, et cetera, and trying to bridge that connection. Um, and so that's where a lot of this uh, information, this, this insight's coming from. Um, we'll start with one of my favorite movies, Office Space. Um, uh, in the 90s, we worked in cubicles. Um, we had, um, it was a start of the rise of the internet age, the rise of information technology. Um, really from the, you know, 70s on to the 90s, um, a lot of mechanical pro the technology we used was really to enable content creation. It was enabling us to more quickly um, migrate um, actuary tables to, to spreadsheets, uh, develop content quickly, publish it, put it on the internet. Um, that started documenting processes in a way that they can be, they can be taken, that others could do it in other geographies. In the 2000s, that led to outsourcing. Um, and uh, another pretty good movie, Outsourced, um, but typifies kind of how front uh, back office jobs started being sent globally around the world. Um, and uh, as, doc as processes became more documented, um, easier to ship to lower cost areas of, uh, of, of, of the world. Um, it led to massive in, uh, flux in the U US and Canadian economy, but also led to the rise of many third world countries and their, their economies. Now, where are we going from here? Now, I'd like to divide the space out into two real work streams. One is front office and the other is back office, or 
frontline workers and back office workers. Um, so office workers, your traditional IT workers, um, we progressed from uh, IT technology being used in the day-to-day -day, uh, activities to business process outsourcing. In the future, what we're going to start having is more immersive um, technology, augmented, aug augmenting the way we work in the office. And I'll get into a little bit more of these technologies from telepresence to more effective online co collaboration. The other work stream is really more the line workers, the frontline workers who are actually going out, meeting with clients, working on um, uh, infrastructure, et cetera. And this is initially started with manufacturing outsourcing, but that's going to progress with AI into Industry 4.0 and ro robotic process automation that we're already seeing taking place right now. Simultaneously with that are the four ways of, of computing. We're um, uh, beginning to get into the immersive transformation. We've gone from mainframes to PCs to mobile. We're at the crux of a next way of interfacing with, with, with the tools that we use to do our work. So uh, wonderful um, handout that uh, Senator Chase passed out, hi highlighting some of the different areas of technology that are going to be outsourced, uh, sorry, automated. Um, but I also want to highlight a few different sectors that automation is most likely to affect. Education being a big one, manufacturing of force, uh, which has already started, but as you see, there are many incumbent industries that um, we might not think initially that um, AI would impact, like education and, 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 and uh, um, agriculture, but that, that, it, that is happening. While this is a potential for, uh, while, while it is going to result in a, a, uh, some jobs being automated, at the same, at the, on the other side, it presents a huge opportunity for a different way of working. Um, in fact, I mean, these are tools that enable us to do more, and there's an ever-growing demand for more things to do. The question is, what are those things that we want that the workforce will be doing? So let me paint a picture of the office of the future. Going back to Hollywood again, this is a, a scene from Avatar. Um, what I, what I want to highlight here is two, two real key aspects. One is it's an immersive, pervasive, and natural way of interfacing with, with our tools. Um, we can see, we'll be able to see 3D data sets in 3D, interact with them as though they're right in front of us, and we'll have AI helping analyzing that and bringing up insights to us to, to better make decisions. So rather than using computers for research or content creation, which is what we're used to, we'll start using these tools for, um, for uh, decision support and creativity support, um, enhance, making us better at being human. Um, few areas of AI that I want to point out that have a lot of value in this space, computer vision will allow us to, uh, computers to identify objects or things of interest that require more uh, context and subject matter expertise to analyze further. Machine learning, again, brings up deep insight and helps with our decision support. Natural language processing actually will decrease the barrier to entry to using tools, uh, allowing you to, um, you know, there's some companies that, uh, that, uh, that I've uh, interacted with that I'm looking at that are trying to figure out how to code through command, through, through voice. Um, so. You can, you don't need to know to pro, how to program to program. You can just issue commands like you're talking to a coworker. Um, speech recognition goes hand in hand with that. And then expert systems, um, leveraging the um, domain expertise across different industries and bringing that more to remote lo locations. How can you get um, uh, deep expertise in cardiology in a place that doesn't have enough cardiologists? Uh, machines can augment uh, um, a, a physician to help them do more. Um, I want to show a few examples that um, kind of are highlighting where things are going right now and, and, and kind of pave the, way, pave the way for the future. Um, Booth Allen has developed a thing called an enforced field that's being used to um, help uh, the Army defend perimeters, identify drones in an automated manner, while also uh, and to, to keep skies secure. Um, 
highly precise, highly um, high resolution computer vision solutions um, are, are being brought to heads up displays to help uh, soldiers identify at a great distance distant threats, making uh, people in the field more, more, more effective. AI Solve is working on um, ways to adjust the level of training that a, someone who's doing virtual reality training receives in, in a hospital scenario to customize that training for the use cases, for the, the areas where um, the student has the most problems. Um, again, making us quicker to learn skills and be ready for the next, next uh, the challenges of the future. A few other technologies that I just want to highlight here, brain-computer interfaces, other, other ways of getting input um, are coming online. Um, and then also, uh, so devices that can read your brain activity and help make this, uh, help uh, define your, uh, understand your intention. And then uh, Holobeam uh, by Valorum, that's actually a remote collaboration scenario. So I actually had this running in my office. I was talking to a, a fellow from Germany, holographically projected in front of me. It was like Star Wars. Um, and imagine what that enables in terms of remote collaboration and, and enabling people to work in different ways, in different areas, to create um, the, tool, the tools of the future. Now, I bring all this up because this is, leads directly to the way we're going to, the gig economy, crowdsourcing. So the number of technologies I put up here, Topcoder, um, WeSolve, which is a challenge-based recruiting uh, company, um, and Hourly Nerd, which is an MBA on demand. Now, rather than hiring an MBA, I can get a, um, people to bid on the task, I need, the analysis I need performed, put that on the market and let, um, and take the best offers. Likewise, I can do that on the side of my, of my other work. And then uh, cognitive services and, our, and uh, web services are making a variety of tools that, are, that used to require a, a developer easier to use, easier to um, access. I can put together a computer vision solution without really knowing the details of, of um, machine learning. So what does that mean for the future workforce? So in terms of how we look at what, who we want to hire and who we want to train up, there's a different skill set that we need to, to plan for. The activities that are required will be the ability to synthesize um, barriers and enablers, understand where technology is going, what capabilities are being brought to market, and how you could leverage that to be productive. Uh, you need to understand how to crowdsource solutions and bring out the best out of a broader ecosystem, not just looking within your company, but looking out to a broader um, innovation ecosystem. Um, it, you go from waterfall development to more agile development, looking at ways to test hypotheses, market test them, see if what your customers will like and what they won't like, and refine your product on the fly to, to, to adjust to that market demand. And then... Uh, Communication skills will always be in demand. You need to be able to socialize what you're building with, with a variety of, um, uh, with both your customers and internally, and evaluate and prototype. So the skills that we're training, well, that we will need to train for, and that are what we're, um, will be slightly different. We we'll need more project managers and solutions architects, fewer um, uh, journeymen or um, skilled artisans. Um, as those professions start getting automated. And so the key takeaways I want to end, end with here are um, really looking at, um, I guess I just uh, <laughs> said it then, solutions architects and project managers. Um, that's going to be, um, and, and, cr and creativity, so artists, um, with the tools to decide whether to build or buy, um, how to put uh, different capabilities publicly available together to form a solution that's tailored to their um, customers. And um, yeah, happy to answer questions. But pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nirav, that was enlightening. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and our next speaker is uh, 
Vinay Narayan. He's Vice President of America's Product and Operations and HTC Vive. V. Vive. Okay, let's see what you have to Thank say. You. Thank you. Cool. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Vinay Narayan. I oversee the product strategy and operations for HTC Vive for the Americas. Um, so by a show of hands, how many of you guys actually have experienced a, a VR product? A, a, a VR product. And a virtual reality, actually, that's a good question. Yeah, a virtual, <laughs> maybe, we should, maybe we'll start there. Um, actually, a very excellent segue into what, what I want to be talking about. Um, Oftentimes when we talk about technology or emerging technology in general, I think there's always a level of apprehension about what is technology and what is it going to take away. I think one of the ways we can look at technology and a lot of the conversations we're having today is really kind of starting with definitions. And as these different technology sets, there's so much stuff that we're talking about, they're always going to be evolving. I think that one of the things as you look at is when you look at these kind of technology buzzwords, whether AR, VR, XR, AI, all those things, just kind of start with a list of what is your definition? What does it mean to you? Because ultimately, technology is just a tool, right? The problems at the end of the day kind of stay consistent. The tools that we use to solve those problems evolve. Um, and I start with definitions quite a bit because they really help us to understand the problem we're trying to solve and also the opportunity we have to solve those problems. Um, and so one of the things um, we guess we kind of look at that, look, think about work, for example. When we talk about, we talk about work quite a bit. Um, and so what really is work, right? Ultimately, work is really defined about getting results. And who actually gets results? And that is essentially your workforce. Why? Because we need to make decisions. So when you look at workforce from that perspective, and you see technology as a tool, then we realize that results are not finite. And therefore, the workforce doesn't actually go away. It's about really using our tools to help expand and utilize that workforce. And that is pretty much what we do with uh, HTC Vive. We're a company that has a platform of, of AR and VR products in, 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 in the day, a platform. Um, and, and in terms of kind of where our product is used, uh, we're, we're one of the largest, if not the largest, VR platform um, in enterprise. Um, globally, and so much of what our technology uses is actually for the future work. And what I really wanted to talk about today is kind of what that opportunity is and how are these technologies being used, and hopefully we can kind of walk away with kind of a sense of a framework of way to really ask questions and understand how we can implement that um, in our areas. So at the end of the day, when we look at the market opportunity for VR and AR, it's pretty sizable. Um, and 16.1 billion uh, by 2020, which is 46% of the overall opportunity in 2020. And that's just a couple, yet less than two years away. Why is that? Because there's some real challenges in growing the enterprise business from a skill set. And there's some real opportunity there as well. What do you think that number represents? It's really spent on training in 2017. Why? Is that a problem? It's actually more of an opportunity. In fact, that increased 30% year over year because training our employees, our future workforce, is inherently val valuable, and companies really invest when there's an ROI. So there is an ROI to have better skilled workforce, but how do we do that better? How do we scale training without disrupting our production lines or, or in, our, in our workflows? I talked about definitions earlier. So when we look at what is immersive technology, ultimately, immersive technology really uh, aims to achieve two things, immersion and accessibility. Immersion is a deeper level of mental engagement. It's not a new thing, it's, it's what we also always aim to achieve, whether we're listening to talks, presentations, going to the movies. Accessibility is the ability to access environments that would be otherwise impossible or, or impractical. So in certain scenario situations, let's say you have two production workers that need to get trained on a line, stopping that line sometimes is impractical, impractical and oftentimes impossible. So what do we do? We don't, we just throw them in that scenario situation. 
And that happens quite often. So what does immersive technologies really allow you to do? It really allows you to access those situations that would be otherwise disruptive or too expensive. As we kind of talk more about definitions, uh, we look at what virtual reality is, what augmented reality is, and ultimately when you combine the two, you get merged reality. These are not mutually exclusive. So as we kind of understand high level kind of what they are and how they play, um, knowing that they all exist, they're all gonna evolve, um, and you don't necessarily have to pick one versus the other. Um, and really, that's the job of the technologist. Like, we don't really have to pick, are we going to use a hammer or a screwdriver? We just know the thing needs to get built. And how many people does it take and how quick? And as decision makers, as policy administrators, that's the most important part. We have teams, we have a lot smarter people than us when it comes to technology that will really implement that solution. It's really about understanding where the opportunity really is. Um, but VR is not new. It's actually been around for decades, um, but it's been very expensive uh, to implement. And that's kind of what brings us to where we're at now. We've evolved in kind of what VR is. Oftentimes, we've kind of experienced VR through Google Cardboard a few years ago, uh, pretty popular, but lackluster, right? Uh, you've, very few people have done a Google Cardboard experience and walked away saying, yep, that's the future. But as we go to the other extreme, which is PC-based VR headsets, which is what Vive is, and we have other products that are non-PC-based, you're like, okay, that is the future. But deploying 10 VR headsets with 10 PCs in an elementary school requires an IT department, and that can be very prohibitive. Um, and so that's why there's now an ecosystem of products that kind of go in between, where you don't need the infrastructure or the cost to be able to implement that. So now we're seeing that landscape evolve from um, a very simple cardboard deployment to very expensive but high immersive uh, PC-based deployment to now something in between. So at the end of the day, the tools are becoming more accessible and they're evolving. And so the definition of the consumerization of XR really is XR moves from more of a proprietary platform, meaning each big company or individual has to build their own kind of hooks. Uh, you're getting now into the retail shelf. You can go to your local retailer, electronics retailer, and actually buy something that is better than most of the military VR solutions of 10 years ago, even five years ago. And more importantly than the capabilities of that hardware, we're talking about a common language. The ability to now, like for example, building apps on your phone, um, that's really consumerization of app building. And now you're seeing that in AR and VR as well. Uh, with very little uh, computer science or programming background, you can actually build meaningful applications onto this platform. So whether you use a Vive or another headset or a platform, you can all integrate and actually do what's best for you and for your business. And that really creates an ecosystem of experiences. So as VR becomes a lot more accessible, and so does AR as well, and AR follows a couple years behind kind of VR adoption, you start to get into kind of these examples that sometimes may not be that compelling, like augmented reality. We've heard about AR and Pokemon Go phenomenon quite a bit, but one of the things is, as you kind of experience this early consumer version of AR, you're like, what does that mean to me? Uh, why do I care about a dinosaur on my coffee table? But in reality, is enterprise actually takes that to the next level. Augmented reality allows you to take these objects and put them into context. And that in-situation contextual awareness is really the power of augmented reality as a platform. But do I have the ability or maybe the resources to develop my own expensive AR headset? Um, or how do I even integrate into that? And I think understanding what AR is and can be really helps you to kind of fit the solution that's right for where you're at. And how does that really change really the way we learn? And why is that also so important? If I were to kind of put up by a show of hands, oftentimes I ask people, are you a visual learner? You'll get a group. Are you an auditory learner? You'll get another group. Um, or are you kind of hands-on? And people are very opinionated a bit about which form of learning uh, means uh, is most effective for them. But the reality of it is we use all three. Um, but in traditional learning modules, we've had to pick one because that's the only way that really scales. And universities are great examples of that. You have large 200, 500 people lecture halls followed by small labs, and you have your kind of nightly homework assignment. So why do you do that? One, you have to scale. You have to get that level of throughput, and ultimately we learn in different ways. But as the workforce and work environments are rapidly evolving, um, a lot of university and education systems that we work with as well are struggling to become relevant in this space. And that's really where AR and VR kind of steps in. So how and why is this my opinion about kind of what the advances for, for AR and VR are? 
ultimately, when you're thinking about brain development, um, XR overall, because it's, it's highly immersive, meaning it's highly mentally engaging, um, really uh, allows you to facilitate model building. So it goes beyond memorization, but uh, allows you to take complex concepts in other areas and allows you to then think at a h higher order. And if you want to translate to that to a workforce, it is ability to take a low-skilled worker and transition them through the skill sets in a very efficient and scalable manner. Um, it also allows us to simulate information from different disciplines. So we've traditionally felt that um, actually production environments, for example, they, they oftentimes think that a particular worker has to do a very linear type of work experience. But if you've worked for 20 years, you know how things work, how things are built, and how um, best to uh, address a situation but our current learning modules don't really address that. And ultimately, it does awaken, awaken spatial memory. So even um, we oftentimes think that the older you get, the harder it is to learn. Um, in fact, that's stu many studies have shown that's actually not the case. Um, and VR has actually proven that time and time again uh, for decades, and not just in recent years. Uh, we've done some studies where students that were historically C and D students um, have been uh, learning advanced concepts using VR. And they were tested against students that learned via traditional classroom methods, uh, and they were historically A and B students. At the time of exams, they performed as high as the A and B students. But over time, the C and D students outperformed the A and B students, because the way in which they learned was so much more immersive, and they were able to retain that information a lot longer. Um, and it's a big reason why NASA or the military uses VR to train their pilots um, and they're astronauts because there are situations where you will never encounter in a training environment. How do you take all of your learnings and make a decision and how do you do that over and over again in a safe and scalable uh, manner? Um, when we talked about the consumerization of VR, that value proposition, that ability for that tool is now available for the general consumer. And so how do we learn? Um, ultimately, learning is all of those five different things, right? It's, it's about asso uh, um, associating deeper uh, memory bonds uh, in, in the facilities in, that, in which we learn. And so all that really means is XR will really shape how uh, the curriculum and industry does about evolving into the new opportunities and new markets. Currently, VR is used across the board. Um, auto manufacturing, pretty much every major auto manufacturer in the world uses VR for a variety of things. Um, they use that for design review. Um, for example, the Jaguar um, I-PACE concept car, when that vehicle was built, that was the first time that exterior engineers and interior engineers met before a car was built. And if you look at that, and that's pretty much the standard, uh, was the standard in auto manufacturing, is you actually have two groups of people that never actually met until it was too late. And we're talking about years apart. Uh, Bell Helicopters, for example, went from a five-year R&D design process to six months. Um, that only not only saves millions of dollars, but now you can also bring in mechanics much earlier on um, as you're designing um, equipment. So you, you can actually work within their environment. There, there are some auto manufacturers also that use VR in the design process. For example, um, I can't name a particular auto manufacturer, but this use case is pretty common. Um, as engineers change how they're uh, designing certain parts, HR actually brings in the line workers and actually has them repair that part in VR to see what the impact on their body is and can they do that efficiently. And before a single dollar is spent in manufacturing or tooling, uh, they discover whether or not that's actually an efficient way to do that, and they can make those on-the-fly on changes. As the global economy becomes a lot more competitive and we are required to be a lot more efficient, automation is a key aspect of that, but utilizing our workforce and, and the ability to, to scale using VR and AR is actually very compelling. Uh, firefighters actually, there's a great many use cases of firefighter training. Uh, if we talk about high-level mental engagement, as well as uh, accessibility to environments that may be either hostile or, or inaccessible is a great use case. Uh, for example, there's, there was a university that actually integrated uh, a Vive headset, but they also used a firefighter's uh, jacket and actually put heat pads on it. So in the environment, you actually see the fire, um, and that hose is actually connected to a hydraulic press. So the, the further, the more water pressure you have, the more feedback you get from it. So it's actually really difficult to be able to do that. Um, the closer you get to the fire, the suit heats up. And so you have a lot of these scenarios um, in that you would actually have in real life about procedure, about communication. Um, even if you want to be able to see clearly, you have to get down lower to the ground, which makes controlling the hose a very difficult. 
Now, why is that important? Well, this particular example was uh, done by an Australian a volunteer firefighter department. They did not have access to that equipment to train on a regular basis. But by utilizing this technology, they were able to train um, in scenarios that just wasn't possible. Uh, medical is another area we see a lot of use cases, um, not just for uh, doctor or physician training as well, but also for patients. One of the challenges you have in the medical space is it takes many years to run through all the scenarios. So the reason why you spend one of the many reasons why you spend such a long time in your clinical trials or uh, kind of more on the hands-on part, it takes many years to actually see all the different scenarios you may, may encounter. But using VR, you can, you can actually experience those in a single afternoon and do it over and over again with lifelike, uh, realistic experiences. And then kind of in workflow training, AR is really at the moment the king of that. Why? Because augmented reality is about enhancement of your current environment. So you're stepping into situation. Um, and we see a lot of companies actually uh, utilize this in actual workflow in situation scenarios. So it really does help to reduce the downtime because you're, you don't actually have to take someone off the line. Um, and I think it also allows them to adapt to business growth. So as seasonality changes, as um, other manufacturing lines or the dependencies change, you're able to kind of adapt in the situation. And then I think the other part that's also very key is you're integrating into your existing platforms. Both AR and VR, as we talk about AI and all these different tools and technologies, they're your kind of future computer window, right? They're, they're that intersection that allows you to process all that complex information in a way that's actually st streamlined and, and very intuitive. And why wait for expensive headsets um, when you can actually just utilize your tablet? Uh, and that's really the power when we talk about the platform. There, there are companies out there that use your iPad or other tablets, and they use computer vision. And computer vision allows um, a user to actually take a picture of an engine, know which make or model it is, and actually guide them into being able to repair uh, that situation. Uh, and that's been uh, critical, especially in the HVAC industry, where there is a growing problem of not having qualified techs in 15 years. Um, that's a group that actually has a, a, a situation where their experienced technicians are getting ready to retire, but it's hard for them to convince someone to take two years of school, then two years of apprenticeship to actually get into the industry. Um, augmented reality helps to really reduce that time and give them the experience that they need to scale up their workforce. And then UPS as well. Large companies also implement uh, VR because they also need to scale. At the end of the day, uh, to be able to train drivers across the board, across the country, with different scenarios, uh, road conditions, as well as uh, different geographic layouts, uh, it's expensive and time consuming. And sometimes we resort to other ways to be able to address customer needs. You keep your East Coast um, employees on the East Coast because West Coast drivers don't know how to drive in snow in different situations. But UPS has figured out a way to actually have them train in VR in how to drive a truck and how to drive in these different scenarios. And they still do on the road um, training, but they can run through way more scenarios in a scalable manner before getting them on, on the road. And another great example of this is, is a forklift company. So Raymond Forklift, they they've taken actually their forklift and actually have plugins for VR headsets. Because to them and to their customers, the ability to train in your actual work environment is that beneficial for them. And this has been great for their supply chain logistics because it has increased worker safety. But when seasonality happens or when things change, they're able to take workers from different areas and allow them to work in different parts of the facilities, as well as redo their facilities as the business and demand changes. So is it AR or VR? It's, it's really, at the end of the day, it's both. It's really kind of what you need. And classrooms are also implementing AR and VR as well. And we're seeing way more redesigns of the classrooms of the future. So what's next? Um, ultimately, the areas that we look at AR and VR to really kind of grow is in the training space, design and collaboration, uh, storytelling, virtual showrooms, and really kind of how that impacts the customer, and then virtual tourism as well. And also the next kind of phase is integration of peripherals. If we're talking about Im uh, immersive and mental engagement, then really physical, tangible things is also what consumers are looking for. And Lowe's is a great example of this. Uh, there are certain stores, uh, Lowe's stores you can actually go to and actually ch check out their hedge trimmers, put on a VR headset, and see what's the difference between having a gas trimmer, electric trimmer, the different lengths, and, how you, and not only how can you use that particular uh, piece of hardware, but also get tips of how to actually do those, uh, perform those functions even better. And how do we, in general, get involved? 
technology can seem very daunting and very complex, but we've seen many communities and many areas really um, utilize their innovation labs and their AR and VR communities as well. There's a lot of really great communities that are really open to share how they do things and also solve your problems as well. At all, um, hackathons, for example, are great. Um, hackathons are essentially where industry uh, comes up with a group and they say, this is the, these are the problems we want to solve for. And groups of individuals, teams of anywhere from three to six, get together in the course of 48 hours, figure out a proof of concept to how to solve that solution. Um, and we're seeing that been a kind of great way to introduce as decision makers of how technology works, as well as kind of prove out, oh, e even in the course of a weekend, is this a way that we can help solve those solutions using these technologies? And that framework, you can use that not just for AR, VR, but there's a lot of great AI hackathons, machine learning. There's, there's so many ways to kind of utilize innovation labs. Universities are absolutely paramount because um, a lot of Fortune 500 companies go to universities and community colleges to help them to understand how to uh, understand technology, how to implement technology, and even how to train the, the next generation of the workforce into implementing that technology. Uh, and the list of partners continues to grow. We see uh, adoption across the board through all these various categories, and this slide's even a year old, so it's uh, tremendously more partners, but essentially kind of all your major areas are represented in terms of investments. And the reason why I even show this slide is not to just show the categories where AR and VR and XR overall are taking off, but to really show that they're seeing a lot of value by implementing these solutions in these spaces. And uh, that's it, any questions? Great, thank you. And our, thank you very much. I'm learning alpha to speak alphabet. That's good, that's good. <laughs> uh, our next uh, speaker is Rich Hodges. Uh, he's with Impact Washington, which is the branch of the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And I'll let you speak a little more about that if you would like, or I could regale you for hours on, on what you do. So thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome our guests from Canada and, of course, our neighbors from Oregon and Idaho. Uh, let's see here if I can exit. I do live in Spokane, but I, I cover the uh, eastern and central part of the, the state. All right, so uh, after those two gentlemen, Rob and Vinay, they know more about technology than I ever dreamed of. Uh, but I was asked to speak more of boots on the ground. Uh, what I see and what we see uh, throughout manufacturers uh, in the state of Washington uh, and in the United States. So uh, a little bit about what Impact Washington is, because I'm sure a lot of you don't know, and what we do, and uh, then what we're seeing in the workforce. So Impact Washington is a not-for-profit not uh, manufacturing that help manufacturers uh, be stronger and keep jobs in, at home. Uh, we're part, uh, like Senator Chase said, we're part of a national uh, network of companies called Manufacturers Extension Partnership. It's under NIST, and we do get some federal money through, through Department of Commerce. There is at least one MEP, Manufacturers Extension Partnership, one MEP in each state. Impact Washington uh, is the MEP affiliate for the state of Washington, has been for the last 20 years. Our neighbors, we work a lot with Tech Help in Idaho and OMEP in Oregon. So I know you're familiar with those. Uh, a bit yes, sure. Microphone. Sorry about that. Yeah. Is that better? I've never had that problem before, so. <laughs> you're you're wandering over this way rather than right. this. All right, so uh, can you hear me now? Good? All right, so uh, because we do get some federal money to help keep our costs down, we have top-notch uh, providers and consultants, uh, we, but we have a requirement for third-party party audit of our clients, and they survey them for impact. So impact is our measure of success, not profit. Uh, together, the MEP National Network is the largest consultancy in the world. 
Uh, we are the conduit for our uh, manufacturing clients to the NIST National Lab Institutes. There's a lot of great things going on there. They're printing skin and uh, organ tissues and someday full organs. They're uh, doing flexible circuits and circuitry. Uh, photonics, instead of using electrons, photons, that'll be a step change for computing speeds. Uh, things like that. Don't have time to go into it, but uh, uh, we are the connection there. And if they have questions or you want to implement or you have some, they can come through the MEP affiliates. So we do many things for our clients. Uh, we still do over 50% of what we do is lean process improvement for both lean office, lean manufacturing, ISO consulting, AS9100. Uh, FISMA training compliance, we have an on-staff uh, food scientist. There's a lot of the food companies around here. Uh, and he is certified to train all the FISMA classes. FISMA, if you don't know what it is, is Food Safety Modernization Act. And under President Obama, uh, it's the first uh, regulations that came about since 1937s that were real regulations. And if you know anything about uh, foodborne illnesses, then you're, you're welcoming what they do. But it's touching a lot of people that they hadn't before. So we do a lot of that. Uh, succession planning, we always say that you don't want to be succession planning in the parking lot of the funeral home. So, uh, And then the one thing I'll mention more is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity isn't a matter of if it'll happen to you, but when it'll happen to you, right? And how costly it'll be. Can you stay in business? And small and medium-sized businesses that we uh, work with all the time are susceptible to that. And so they're targeted a lot. So don't think just because you're small, you're not targeted. I mentioned the NIST survey. One of the good things that does come out in this survey is we get feedback not only on our impact and what, we've, what job we've saved or what uh, new sales or new mar products have been created, but also uh, what our clients' needs are and what's going on. So as you can see, cost reduction and growth, uh, and profitable growth especially, are still the two top. But an interesting thing is that employee uh, recruitment uh, and training goes along with that is the fastest growing uh, area of, of challenge for our clients as they report. This is boots on the ground reporting. Um, so why is that? Why now? Why not before? And we're all told in the 80s uh, and the 90s that over 50% of our workforce is going to retire in the next 10 years, right? Well, they also told us that Y2K was going to be a terrible tragedy. Well, hope, luckily, both of those things didn't really occur to the, to the level that they were telling us, right? Uh, it's interesting in this article from AARP magazine that the disappearance of pensions is one of the factors increasing the retirement age and driving some of the baby boomers not to retire, right? Another big factor that I don't think they consider to the full extent of is an untapped resource pool in the labor, right? And that's women entering the workforce. So since 1970, there's been 42 million of them. And that is a huge untapped resource pool that really wasn't considered. Even though it's happening, people didn't understand how big it was. And I know that even today, there's more women graduating from college than men. So I can see that 46.8% going to 47, 48 uh, within my working lifetime at least. Another big factor that pushed out why the resources for labor didn't, didn't actually come to fruition right away was because of loss of jobs. We lost 5. million jobs between 2000 and 2010 from overseas uh, competition and also for offshoring, right? Uh, the good news is, is in 2017, we got 196,000 jobs back in this country. The first time since the 90s that we actually had more jobs coming in than going out. Now, this isn't a political thing. And so, the, you know, just because there's a new sheriff in the White House doesn't mean that that's all it, what it's about. There's a lot of factors that go into what that situation was for 2017. Some of them are in the increased costs. I mean, just for example, Chinese labor doubled in the last five years. It's still at a double-digit rate uh, of climbing. Of course, their economy is growing at 6.7%, so it makes sense, right? Uh, the U.S. dollar devaluation. Uh, last year is the first time since 2010 and 11 that the dollar actually decreased, which gives you other countries more buying power of our services and products, right? Uh, the previous 5.5 years, it increased 30 points on, on the scale. And in the last year, in 2017, it actually came down 16 points. So that was a huge help for uh, creating more jobs in America. Also, economic growth, basic principles of economics, right? More supply and demand. Uh, the Asian markets are growing over 
uh, developing countries, 4.5%. Even us, we were close to 3%. So that you have more demand, you're going to have more jobs. Uh, improved productivity with factory automation. And this is what we're getting to uh, with Narav, as he was talking about. Uh, we always talked about automation taking away jobs, right? But if you aren't competitive, all the jobs go away. And uh, the other thing, too, is we're finding out from real experience, uh, even low-margin businesses like in the food industry, they're the ones being forced. We see it every day. They're the ones being forced to automate because they have to be competitive. And they aren't losing employees. They're actually just making more products, and they're being competitive in the marketplace. Uh, so we found from experience that that's the case. So key points for me, right? Labor is becoming an issue. Boomers are retiring. We're creating jobs that require new skills, new training. Uh, some of what Vinay said, the training experience of doing all of your senses is great. Um, we also uh, teach how to do that. Uh, the Pacific Northwest is an attractive area for business growth, not just because it's beautiful here, relatively lower cost of power and labor, but also Sam Wolkenhauer, uh, who spoke here at the I-90 Aerospace Conference, uh, right next door here uh, in the spring, said an interesting thing. He said there's two main population growth corridors in America. One is North Carolina down through Florida. I think some baby boomers are going there. Uh, but also another one is Nevada up through Washington uh, and Idaho. And in fact, Idaho followed by Nevada, Utah, and Washington are the top fourth population growth states percentage-wise in the United States. That's attractive to business, right? Labor is an issue. <clears throat> uh, we talked about the ROI for technology. The technology is maturing, so it takes less time investment, less dollar investment uh, to bring it online and to use it. Also, the, the new technology to identify vision uh, capability and learning capability, you can have machines that actually can pick up random things and do things that aren't always the same. They don't have to be behind closed, uh, screened off cages. They can actually work alongside of humans because of the technology of sensory and, and other things. So it makes it very, a lot easier in a lot of the tasks, uh, like repetitive work, they don't get carpal tunnel. They don't go home at night and they don't go on vacation, right? So between the cost, uh, the rising cost of labor and associated insurances associated with that, then the, it's penciling out the ROI for, for doing automation. And we're seeing a lot of companies that even two years ago wouldn't even thought about it are doing automation or, or adding a robot into their high t uh, repetitive task things. So that's happening. So labor's becoming an issue for real now and automation is happening. Those things are happening. Whether we do anything about it or not, they're happening. We see it every day when we're boots on the ground. What can we do to be successful in our region, though, and in our country, uh, in our two countries in this case? It is the training, right? Training is key to the success, and that's a challenge for all of us. You know, how robotics is going to be, bring about increased IT, electrical, and programming skills that we need. We, I, I have clients all the time asking for where they can get electricians, trained electricians. We need to learn how to train. Industry 4.0, new skills for maintaining a factory. You're not just filling reservoirs and greasing joints. It's a lot of other stuff. And AI and the Internet of Things is going to speed this up. Uh, the change of technology is rapidly increasing. It's not slowing down. So I hope that was uh, informative a little bit, boots on the ground. I, we see this every day. Uh, and also, I'd like to give you a little video. I think you'll enjoy in its short two and a half minutes or so. Uh, thank you. Since the time of the earliest tools and the mastery of fire, technological progress has been an integral part of being human. By utilizing technology, we have surpassed the most efficient and capable life forms on our planet. But in a world of ever increasing complexity and finite resources, we are now presented with a whole new set of challenges. How will the next industrial revolution change the way we live, and quite possibly, what it means to be human? Throughout history, there have been periods of remarkable innovation. The first industrial revolution created new goods and new jobs through the introduction of manufacturing. The power of water, iron, and steam helped bring manufacturing out of our homes and into a larger world. Cities and opportunities grew. In the second, we forged better materials such as steel, 
harnessed the power of oil through internal combustion engines, and utilized electricity through generators and transmission lines. We catalyzed manufacturing and expanded what was possible. After the digital revolution, we possess computers so small they can fit in our pockets, and they're a million times cheaper and a million times more powerful than the best supercomputer only 25 years ago. Connecting through the internet has encouraged an incredible library of knowledge, setting the stage for the greatest revolution yet. So what is the fourth industrial revolution? Industry 4.0 involves a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds and impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. Central to this revolution are emerging technology breakthroughs in areas such as robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, nanotechnology, and 3D printing. These technologies can improve lives, create new jobs, make goods cheaper and better, and impact the world in ways we have yet to imagine. While it's remarkable to see the current trends, it's important to remember that technological progress is not simply guaranteed. It requires people to make it happen. This is your opportunity to get involved. This revolution does not happen without your help. Now is the time to be imagining. Now is the time to be creating. Now is the time to be a manufacturer. Thank you. Well, so we're going to move a little bit away from technology for a while and talk about workforce issues. And our first speaker is going to be Marina Parr. She is with the uh, uh, Washington Workforce Board. Uh, she is a communication director. And we will look forward to hearing you. everybody awake out there now that I'm talking loudly? <laughs> I'm probably going to talk too loud now. Um, I'll make sure I can use this thing. Okay. What have I done? I, well, I, just, oh, okay. I didn't finish for you. Okay. I helped, but I didn't help 100%. Did, did help That's, my wife says that too. Oh, okay. So, so it'll be like, I just click this and then like this. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so yes, I'm, I'm the communications director with the states, with Washington's Workforce Board. Uh, there's a bio, as Senator Chase said. Uh, our, we, ha we are a state agency as well as a board. The board's made up of equal parts business and labor, voting members, and they meet every other month. But our agency has a lot of research staff. We look at workforce programs, evaluate them, see what the employment outcomes are. Do people get jobs? Are they successful? So we do a lot of different things, but in today, today we're just gonna talk about the future of work. And a lot of times when people talk about the future of work, they get very, very scared, right? You say robots. And I actually make a lot of jokes about it at work. I'll say, oh my gosh, I better be good to my robot overlord. You guys are just not laughing. But I am afraid of my robot overlord. So, so yeah, these are some real fears that people have. What's gonna happen to our workforce? Will there be enough jobs? Will robots take over the world? Will we have more and more people participating in the gig economy where they do the short-term contract jobs and they're just hustling to pay the bills and they're working for Lyft, they're working for uh, companies that stock groceries and bring groceries to your front door? I saw an article the other day about gig economy workers that were participating in a panel. Maybe some of you read that story. And they were some really hard stories from people. They were working 60 hours a week and barely making a living wage. So is this the future that we want for our workforce? Is this what we're aiming for? No. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So, you know, a lot of times we look around, we go, wow, we have the best economy, right? We have about 4% unemployment rate in Washington state. Uh, I know it's higher in some pockets of the state, depending on if you're in a rural area. But this is masking a silent crisis. And actually, it was Senator Chase who really talked about that with me, and it really just illuminated this problem. We have about 22% of people in Washington state between the ages of 20 and 64, what we call prime working age, 
who are basically sitting on the sidelines. They don't count as unemployed. How many people in this room know how we count unemployment? Go ahead and raise your hand if you know it. So a few people, panelists, a few panelists. Know. So you know, before I start working in workforce development, if someone had told me the state has 4% unemployment, I would have sort of believed that this 4% of people don't have jobs. Well, that's actually not correct, right? We look at unemployment for people who are actively seeking work and available to work. So those are some caveats that we put on that. So in fact, there's a much larger cohort of folks who either are technically unemployed or in fact jobless, they just lack jobs. So that problem is already at our doorstep, right? Even before we just gallop off with automation and, and the gig economy, right? And then we have the Internet of Things. You know, preparing for this presentation was really interesting because I hadn't even heard of that until like a few weeks ago. And, and again, Senator Chase, she, she will talk to you a lot about the Internet of Things. It's very exciting, very dynamic. I'm excited just looking at that slide. <laughs> so the Internet of Things, a lot of things going on in the background. Think, you know, anything as simple as maybe you want to <clears throat> program your crock pot, right? You could remotely turn it off now. Isn't that cool? Or you're looking at your house and, and it's, you know, your temperature gauge in your, in your house, your thermostat can be done remotely. These devices are talking to each other. They're, they're collecting data and moving them back and forth. It's just growing exponentially. So there's a lot of growth in this area, but it isn't very well tracked. We know it's happening, but we just don't know exactly to what degree. And there's our handsome workforce board chair, Perry England. He, his company, so we have a workforce board, as I mentioned, is made up of business and labor and government folks. And Perry is our board chair. He works for McDonald Miller Facility Solutions. And he re recognized there was a shortage of folks who were skilled to do some of the uh, sensors and controls work for his company. So they do things like, you know, HVAC systems, electrical systems for buildings. Couldn't find them. Uh, it, but it turned out, as he decided to uh, kind of create an apprenticeship, the first of its kind in the state. So Perry just said, I'm going to work with some school districts. I'm going to work with some community college. I know we have some community college folks in the audience. I'm going to work with some, even some four-year universities to create this cohort of apprenticeship to get skilled workers. But as he looked into it, he began to realize, this isn't just for my company. This isn't just for my mechanical contracting industry. It was pervasive. It was across multiple industries from maritime, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, just a broad swath of folks that they, all these industries needed these folks, but they couldn't find them, but they didn't really get together and talk about it, right, because they were across different industries. This is my existential slide. If a tree falls in a forest and you're not there to witness it, does it make a sound? If you have an occupational area that doesn't have a name, does it really exist? And this was certainly the case because this type of occupation that Perry England was searching for and all these different industries were searching for, it doesn't have an agreed upon title from the U.S. Department of Labor. So the U.S. Department of Labor, some of you guys know this, some of you don't, they give these job classification titles out. And that's how we track how they're doing. And if you don't have a name for something, then you can't collect data on it, right? So that's not very helpful. So should we just sit around waiting for the US Department of Labor to come up with a name? No. <laughs> no, you should not wait for the federal government. Do not wait. So, um, so, you know, we need to take action now because things are changing rapidly, right? We need to start making movement on this. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, the Workforce Board, in conjunction with the University of Washington Center for Healthcare Studies, did something similar with healthcare. So, healthcare, we knew there was lots of shortages on the ground of healthcare professionals, but it was hard to quantify. Things were changing rapidly. So, in 2016, we jointly launched what was called a Health Sentinel Network so that employers on the ground and healthcare throughout Washington could report back to us on what were the occupations in shortage, what were some of the recruiting challenges, what were some of the changing nature of their occupations. And so just as an example, we can do these things. We can get this information from employers and we need to keep employers engaged in the future work so that we can you know, work to, to make those changes in real time. 
And that's, and this is what this slide's about too, which is really just that feedback loop with employers, making sure they're at the table, that they're true partners in this system, um, which can be a challenge for workforce folks. People here that do workforce development, we know that employers are key. We know that they need to be part of the solution and be full investors in the solution, but it just takes a little bit of extra work, a lot of outreach to do that sometimes. This is the other big question. Who will help us chart the future? Please stop raising your hand. <laughs> okay, no, you, you weren't raising your hand. But actually, we have a future of work task force that is in process right now. This is the state of Washington, thanks to Senator Chase, who was the primary sponsor for a bill. Uh, so this task force is forming. It includes people from business. It includes people from labor and legislators from both sides of the aisle. Very good bipartisan support to look at the future of work. Really, Washington State, I think, is at the forefront in addressing that question. So this task force is forming, and I think the rest of the United States, as well as probably Canada, will be looking to see what this task force comes up with in the coming year. At the same time, the Workforce Board is also hiring a policy and research manager to look at the future of work. It's a very unusual opportunity. By the way, if you know people that have the skill set to be an economist, to also lead a task force, and to do data and research, it's kind of a unicorn position, uh, we're still hiring for that position. So it's, it's a really cool opportunity, the future of work. Look at careers.wa.gov if you're interested. Shameless plug. And this is like this, the most awesome cartoon and the scariest one, right? Oh my gosh, what's going to happen to people? So really, you know, overall, our workforce is going to have to have a, a much more entrepreneurial mindset. People are going to need to start thinking of themselves really as, even if they work for a company, as in, in one sense, a free, just a, a real free agent because they have to try to take control of their careers and their skills, and they have to be looking for opportunities to skill up so they can stay competitive and stay on top of changes. And so we need to have people kind of learn those skills, um, the sort of entrepreneurial skills that some entrepreneurs have naturally, but others do not. So that's also working with employers to kind of bring those skills out, give employees time to gain those skills, kind of get specific training um, it was interesting to hear about the VR, for example, because that, that's a very good way to do that training, obviously. So this is another shameless plug. This is our upskill backfill project. This is a, a workforce board project in conjunction with workforce development councils we have in our state. And we have eight projects on the ground right now. Uh, these are projects where employers in different industries are basically providing some up upskilling opportunities for their current employees, so those employees are able to advance to higher level positions, upskilling, opening up opportunities for frontline people to fill those positions, the backfill. So again, that's that skilling up of your workforce, getting the skills that your employees need, and then bringing in new people as your company grows and succeeds because of that. I also have copies of the report on the table for those who wanted to read more about upskill backfill. And that's, that's my presentation. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Marina and uh, Debbie. There we go. Debbie is Vice President of Operations for Boardman Foods, and her, her uh, bosses are all here, I see. I'm very pleased to see that. Thank you for coming, <laughs> gentlemen. How do I get out of here? Wait a minute, we have our own technician oh, on board. Yeah. What, do you know which one it is? Marina? Okay, can everybody hear me? Um, Debbie Rady, Vice President, Boardman Foods. I'm also the chair of the board for Food Northwest. And I want to thank uh, Lindsay, uh, Melissa Lindsay, our commissioner, for coming today. We've got Bill Rochalt, our 
uh, Director of Eastern Oregon Workforce Investment Board, Brian Mogg, the President of Boardman Foods, and David McGivern of Food Northwest President. So thank you for coming and supporting me today. Oregon Workforce Statistics. Oregon businesses reported 65,100 vacancies in the spring of 2018. Retailers reported 9,900 vacancies, while leisure and hospitality vacancies totaled 7,300 in Oregon. Healthcare and manufacturing were among the top sectors for vacancies. Wages for job openings in just these two industries averaged $21 an hour. Kate Brown, the governor of Oregon, has helped create a plan to address the workforce challenges in our state. It's called Future Ready Oregon. The key goals of Future Ready Oregon are to invest in education that uses work-based learning strategies, $300 million investment in career and technical education, CTE, in the 2019 state budget. Prepare our current workforce by arming them with the skills they need. Higher Education Coordinating Commission received $1.8 million to support apprenticeship expansion in IT and healthcare and expand the career paths in the healthcare industry. Prepare our future workforce by making investments in education. Identify gaps and make recommendations for any policy changes that would align and leverage these programs to improve outcomes in both secondary and post-secondary levels. Technology and the workforce. How does new technology on the production floor affect the workforce needs in today's modern manufacturing plant? It's changing the way we do business. Let's see what's happening at the Frito-Lay facility to find out more. I'm going to try. <laughs> Welcome to the Frito-Lay plant in Perry, Georgia, one of the biggest chip production factories in the world. When people hear Frito-Lay, they think about our irresistible products. Doritos, Cheetos, Sun Chips, Tostitos, Lay's Chips, Funyuns, and many more. But behind these amazing products are several layers of cool technology. And the backbone of this massive operation is you, the industrial maintenance mechanic. Oh, for sure. So I've been with Frito-Lay for 17 years and in industrial manufacturing for 25. I've seen a lot change. I know what you're thinking. The mechanics job. It's hard, it's dirty and greasy. Well that was back in the day. Today it's all about automation, technology and career opportunities. I'd like to take you on a journey. Let's go see what a day in the life of industrial maintenance mechanic is all about. Come on. The job of an industrial maintenance mechanic is essentially to maintain the various machines and electronics that keep the plant running. Now, let's take you through the various stages of production. Everything starts here in unloading. The raw materials such as corn, potatoes, and oil arrive via rail and trucks. Check out these cool stats. We have 10 to 12 train cars bringing in produce and 20 trucks arriving with about 1 million pounds of potato every single day. Next stop from unloading is the mixing rooms. Here, the raw materials are mixed and stored for relocation to the next section. Processing. This is where the products are cooked, baked, or fried. Here, in our massive processing stations, we have fryers which run on steam and ovens which run on natural gas. And of course, the pots for cooking. But how do these various gases and liquids get here? Well, let's show you. This is the mechanical room. As you can see from the multiple pipes, this room serves as the hub and delivery system for the various materials used in the processing of the products. 
Your job here is to ensure everything is running smoothly and efficiently. Now, there's another component to this operation, which is the electrical room. Here, you get to work on master control panels and programmable logic controllers. It might seem complicated, but they all talk to each other seamlessly through unique IP addresses in our internal network. Frito-Lay products remain a favorite at parties and gatherings throughout the decades because of the great taste. That's what we do here in the seasoning room. These machines need monitoring and maintenance. As with other sections, your technical proficiency ensures we stay on track to fulfill our daily production cycles by keeping these engines running constantly. When the products are fully processed and ready to be bagged, we take them to the packaging section. Here, you can see how the boxes are folded by the machines and sent down to the bagging stations for the products to be boxed. As an industrial maintenance mechanic, you also play a role in this critical part of the quality control process. As we head into the last leg of the process, we arrive at warehousing. Our massive warehouse is half a million square feet, and as you can imagine, it takes a lot of moving parts to stack these rows and columns of products. We call these ground robots AGVs, which stands for Automatic Guided Vehicles. Their job is to transport the various pallets of products throughout the distribution center. Our warehouse runs a massive nine stories high, or 90 feet. The only way we can stack pallets this high is to utilize our very tall cranes. We have about six of these working around the clock. Our industrial maintenance mechanics keep a watchful eye over all this technology to ensure the products are delivered to the grocery stores on time. So now you've seen a day in the life of an industrial maintenance mechanic. I trust you see it's an exciting and stable career opportunity. I'd encourage you to reach out to us here at Frito-Lay, your recruiter or counselor, to see what it would take to join the Frito-Lay team. Let's talk about uh, Boardman Foods. Uh, Boardman Foods is an onion processing plant in Boardman, Oregon, right along the Columbia River. Started in 1992. Um, the owners are cousins, and I've been working with them ever since the beginning. Um, we have over 200 employees now. We started with just 69. We're privately owned, and as I already mentioned, we're, where we're located. We, we pack primarily frozen onions, but we also do fresh pack onions and fresh onions. What are the workforce challenges that we face every day? We have competition for our employees and a high economic growth rate uh, in the area of the state at the Poromoro. Um, I've just recently heard someone say, um, you know, we're now happy when an employee shows up 15 minutes late. They actually showed up today. Um, so our, our uh, challenges are great. The need for housing and public transportation is real in our rural region. We have training programs for incumbent workforce on new technologies as well as those soft skills. When workers are entering the job market, they're not prepared to meet the needs of the advanced manufacturing of the technology I just showed you in the video. Modern manufacturing uses technology and automation to perform tasks that once were done by hand. These are pictures from our plant today. On the left is the KUKA robot. This is the same robots that are used to um, manufacture the Tesla cars. And we're using them to stack uh, the cases of product you see on the line on the pallets. On the left, you'll see a programmable logic control, PLC is what uh, is commonly referred to. The, an operator can operate our plant at a remote location or somewhere in the plant at a control center and turn on and off all the various equipment 
that processes our onions every day. What are some of the workforce solutions that we're working on? We support the CT, the career technical education programs in our high schools. Participate in events, local schools and job fairs and get the word out about our jobs and our careers and how good of a living it is for us. Partner with public agencies and learn about the various programs, grants, and other resources that are available. Partner with the community college on offerings and help them with the development of the curriculum. Assist with externship programs where teachers are being educated on the skills and needs of the industry so they can take that back into the classroom. And allow for employees to have flexible work schedules to attend courses related to their field. We also financially support those incumbent workers in attending the community college courses that will help them. You can get involved. Help prepare our future workforce for the jobs of tomorrow. NSF International recently showcased this technology to the American Frozen Food Institute. This method of training will revolutionize how we train our workforce and provide the remote support. I have talked about a little bit here, but I'm going to show you a short video clip that really showcases this technology. iSucceed is bringing the future to the present by turning smart glass technology into business solutions that deliver unparalleled results. Solutions that will have a huge impact on our day-to-day -day lives and will transform how the food industry conducts business. iSucceed, through its work with Google and other major players, is at the forefront of the development of these solutions and is helping to lead this revolution within the food industry with process patterns dating back to the spring and summer of 2015. Be part of this revolution, which will change how we manage and facilitate expert communication and training in the food industry on a global scale. The world has become a much smaller place. We see greater efficiency with knowledge transfer occurring almost instantaneously around the globe. We are removing the need to physically be in a location in order to share expertise. We are eliminating the high cost of travel by allowing you to virtually connect from your office to any location around the globe. Explore Smart Glass technology with eye training, a smart training program that avoids the shortcomings of existing training modalities. This revolutionary hands-free Smart Glass device training provides an interactive learning experience where employees are no longer required to understand written procedures or recipe cards. No more learning away from workstations through video or e-learning programs or even viewing monitors or tablets at their stations. Avoiding the high costs of peer-to-peer -peer training and the inconsistencies such training brings. These issues are all in the past. With eye training, employees are free to move around their workstations and enjoy a full range of movement. With their hands free and a full range of view, they will learn intuitively, directly and interactively with the assistance of worker instructions presented in real time as they are performing the task. Eye training is just the beginning. Imagine if you can that each training action point becomes a mapped piece of data. Data that is uploaded to the cloud. Data that can be used to identify the specific actions associated with each task. One step further and see a scenario where a smart glass can use that bank of data to determine when an employee deviates from the correct procedure. Not only will that error be detected, but the device will also intervene and provide visual corrective prompts, all the while logging these actions into the cloud. Smart glasses delivering augmented intelligence. I succeed through its partnership with Google and others, continues to bring forward smart glass technology solutions, tapping into the many benefits they can bring, not only within the food industry, but in all aspects of our lives. The future of smart training is here, today, with I succeed. The other application for this technology is uh, for food safety around the world, where we're buying ingredients from Asia and who knows where. And the auditors and the people that are here in the United States that might need to buy those products want to see how it's being produced, what are the methods happening, and be able to audit from afar without having to travel to these places on a regular basis. So they can put this, uh, these eyeglasses on 
a person who's in another country producing an item that will be uh, imported here and uh, watch how they do it and make sure that those meet our standards of today. Um, I'll answer questions later, but thank you very much. And our final, thank you very much, and our final speaker before we enjoy our, our uh, roundtable discussion and answer questions is Alicia Benson, and she is with Greater Spokane Incorporated. Right. Well, now I realize I'm the one that stands as a cleanup after you've been sitting for two hours almost. Uh, and between you and questions and you and whatever the night holds, I want to say first, um, I work for Greater Spokane Incorporated. I am the Chief Operations Officer. And so welcome to our great community and region. We're so excited to have Penoir here. And I know many of you got to hear from our mayor earlier today. And we're just really excited about what's happening in Spokane and the opportunity to showcase that in many different ways and share what it truly, this, this region runs on collaboration and innovation. It's how we get things done. And the partnership and collaboration we have between education, government, and industry and business is really what powers us forward every single day. So really excited that you're here. From Greater Spokane Incorporated, we're the regional business development organization, and our job is to create a place where organizations can come together to advocate on behalf of the region, to think about how we drive strategic growth, and how we champion a talented workforce. And so that's what gets us up every day and drives the work that we do. We have an incredible board of 70 people who are the CEOs of different businesses throughout our region, who are the CEOs of our higher education institutions, who are the CEOs of our K-12 schools, and who are the CEOs of really important community-based organizations that help us think about the fabric of what Spokane is, where we want to be, and how we continue to grow. And that's what keeps us um, moving every single day. It's interesting, my CEO, um, Todd Milkey, and I were at our National Association Conference last week in Des Moines, Iowa. Really a fabulous uh, week of being able to learn and grow with um, organizations like ours across the country. And we had uh, the opportunity to have the uh, CEO of Manpower Group North America um, talk with the group. And Becky Frankenwitz, if you haven't met her, is quite a dy dynamo gal and is running and leading a significant uh, workforce um, organization in our country. And she talked a lot. It was really relevant as we think about this conversation around uh, technology and how it's driving and changing the workforce of tomorrow. She had just was talking about some of the work they had just accomplished um, and some survey work that they've been doing with a huge number of their manufacturing clients. And somebody had asked the question of, is AI killing the jobs, or is virtual reality killing the jobs? And what they're finding through their research is that the jobs are changing. So they're not seeing a decrease in um, the number of jobs in their manufacturing clients, but they're seeing a change in what that work is, and that they were identifying up to 165 different types of jobs that didn't exist today. Um, but we're going to be existing in these manufacturing companies. And so our challenge and job as folks thinking about workforce and talent as we think about this intersect is how are we going to address um, that. And so from an organizational standpoint, as a regional business development organization, we've, um, I think, my job today um, to, is to think about how, how are we doing this on a regional level. You've heard incredible information from the partners here, but what are communities doing? How are we tackling this together? Um, what are those challenges that we have? And so as a regional organization, this is our strategic plan. This is what we get up and drive every single day. But what's key to that is that the talent piece 
is a huge piece of those foundation, foundational strategies. And so what is it that we're going to do? But no matter what, how are we thinking about this entire ecosystem of business? And you've heard a lot today about entrepreneurship um, and that drive and those skills that we have. Um, if you have time, Jessica Kirk, our Director of Business Retention and Expansion and Startup is here, and she's been here most of the week. She can talk um, in detail with you about some of how we're thinking about that. And it really rolls up into thinking about as a community how we drive key strategic um, priorities for our region forward. And that everything you've heard today is um, tied up in this. We have had a huge, we have a full uh, throttle effort as a region around how we grow the life and health sciences in our region and what, that, that, what does that mean. You had the opportunity last night to be over at WSU Spokane. Tomorrow you're going to be able to hear from Lars Gilbert, the CEO of our university district, really thinking about how that powers um, the work forward. I also want to, Stacia Rasmussen, who's our business development manager for life and health sciences, is here. And um, if you want to know about um, how life sciences is driving and changing and the workforce skills that are needed, um, she, the amount of research that she's been driving um, as we think about that for this region is huge. Um, and how all of that translates to manufacturing and advanced uh, manufacturing and aerospace is really key. We see so many different congruencies between that. But underpinning to all of that is how are we growing education attainment for our region? You've heard about what it looks like on a statewide level. And so we, um, as a region, decided a number of years ago that we needed to make sure we were taking a deeper look um, at education attainment in our region and thinking about that um, across the entire uh, continuum. And so we, back actually in 2013, as a region adopted a community goal for increasing our education attainment. And when we talk about that, we're talking about apprenticeship, we're talking about certificates, two-year, four-year. But as a region, we had just under 40% um, education attainment in our region. And that's not good enough if we think about the types of um, workers that are needed. We're, um, as a community, celebrating a big win from an economic development standpoint with Amazon deciding to open a fulfillment center here. 1,500 jobs to come online in the next couple of years and potential to grow. But what does that mean? And are we training those workers? Uh, those may be an opportunity for some of our lower skill workers to come into the workforce and get training and have that opportunity for upward mobility. But what does that mean for how that translates to our manufacturing sector, to the rest of our uh, distribution logistics? Lots of really important opportunity for how we align around that. I think the other big why for us, and I um, borrowed this slide from our friends at Washington STEM, they're doing some really incredible um, data work. And I think at the end of the day what's driving for us is that we have got to figure out how to do some things differently. Right now we're um, growing post-secondary attainment at about 0.9%. But to even meet the demand for the jobs that are going to be open in the next few years, we have to increase that to 5%. So that's part of what we're waking up every day thinking about how do we do that together. From a Greater Spokane Incorporated standpoint, um, this won't mean much to the rest of you, but I, what I want to um, touch on here is that for us, it's that we're keeping the uh, thought of education attainment central to all of the work that we do. As an organization, we're bringing to their business and education every single day, um, thinking about the complexities of that. We have an incredible, and I know there's a few of them left in the room, an incredible community and technical college system here in our region that are really focused on how they can be nimble and meet those needs. When we have, as you'll hear more about tomorrow, a really robust uh, higher education infrastructure for a region of our size. At the same time, we need to be thinking in a much deeper way around career-connected learning or around work-based learning. And we've been doing this work as a region for many, many years, and we're excited that there's a really increased effort, which I'll talk about in just a second at the statewide level, because it's what drives when we think about how we're preparing young people. The other underpinning, and you just heard this a little bit from some of our others, is around how are we upskilling the existing worker? We as a region have 86,000 working adults with some college but no degree that are going to be instrumental for meeting the immediate demand and need that we have and whatever those jobs look like. And so for us, it's all of those pieces coming together. This just gives you a sense, a snapshot of some of the players. It doesn't even do justice, but the, the variety of folks coming together um, to think about how we tackle education attainment um, in our community. So I was mentioning the effort that's happening at a statewide level. In the state of Washington, um, our governor about a year ago launched a Career Connect Washington effort. And uh, this just gives you a sense, much like the visual I just put up for our region, the types of players that are involved in the state of Washington in thinking about this continuum of career, connect, um, career connected learning. And for us, that's really exciting. It's thinking about what is this ladder 
of opportunity. And I think what's been really um, great to see to change for the state of Washington is that for so long we were just talking about um, each path separately, and now we're thinking about it as a ladder where people can step in at different points. They may step back out, but also thinking about continuing education for the worker as well as what does that um, full-time employment look like on the end and being able to really put that all together. And what's been really important about the effort being led at the statewide level is I think a really instrumental opportunity where we have um, significant private sector businesses coming together, strong government leadership, and strong um, education leadership coming together to actually think about what are those levers at a statewide level um, that they can drive. And it's also really then important for us because what those levers look like at the state is what helps us do our job here on the ground. This just gives a sense, um, and again, it's going to be hard to see, but work that we've been doing for two years ahead of Career Connect Washington, thinking about that pathway for young people. Um, what are those different types of experiences? How are they getting that um, training? And I think at the end of the day in all of this, what has come out of the work over the last few years is the more experiences we can be providing young people to actually experience virtual reality before they get to the workplace is key to helping make sure that we're putting people forward um, in those jobs. There's a lot of work around STEM. There's a lot of work um, thinking about all of that. But we have to be able to have strong STEM skills married with the ability for people to communicate and problem solve and show up on time in our places of business and that those two pieces have to continue to be working together. So I want to move forward a little bit. What I want to say in the career connected learning space is that we as a region, so to take that statewide work is happening, but what we decided to do here in Spokane as a um, group is that we need to increase those number of experiences by 15%. And so that's a full frontal effort of a lot of partners coming together to think about how do we make sure that more of our young people are getting those experiences than they are today. Then the last thing I want to land, so two things really that I want to say. So on a regional level, um, two of those drivers for how we do our work is that we've had the opportunity for six, almost seven years now to be a regional STEM network. And what I think is so important about that is when we first started, it was only about science, technology, engineering, and math. And now we're talking robustly about making sure that we're creating a robust learner um, and somebody that's actually prepared to show up on time and do the job that's needed to be done. The other piece of that is that in this work, um, if we go forward, is I think that as a region we're further ahead um, than many areas because we've been having these intentional conversations as a community with business and education about what's needed, um, what's that pathway look like, are we having those right training opportunities in the community and technical colleges, or how does that pathway align with the great work that's happening over with University of Washington and Washington State around medical education? We have to be sitting at that same table and then going back in. And somebody mentioned earlier about making sure that we're actually articulating um, what's really happening on the, on the work floor, and that's a, a lot of what this is about. And so the last piece is that um, in all of that, we have launched a program, Business After School, that's actually and it's going to be headed into its fifth year. But what's different about that is that we're actually bringing young people into the place of business. And so there's a really important place for career fairs and those kinds of experiences. But what happens in career fairs is that we tend as employers to send the lowest person on the totem pole um, to sit at that career fair. And they don't represent what happens in your business every single day. And so our community actually decided five years ago we needed to flip that model. And how did we actually get more young people in being able to actually feel what business looked like? And what's happened in that time is their exposure. So instead of being exposed to one person um, in a company, they may be meeting 5, 10, 25 different people. And every single one of those individuals has a different pathway to the work that they're doing today. They're also able to see what that work really looks like. What kind of training do they need? What kind of skills? How is things like virtual reality and AI taking place in that company? It has made it much more tangible. And I think what we've seen now in the last four years of the program is people are actually making um, students are either opting in to a pathway sooner, or we have students that are opting out because they realize they don't like blood, for example. And so I just leave you with that. These are just some pictures of our community at work um, between business and education, and that that's the driver for how we continue to bridge and link what we're doing. And with that, I'll turn it back to the senator. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank our panel members. Uh, I think it was really uh, very informative. When we see the changes in technology in the workplace, we see also see changes in the organization of the workplace. You know, we used to have uh, corporations, hierarchy, 
Now we have more work teams. Uh, you'll see a lot of changes, and, and I, I, we have about 15, 20 minutes, so we can answer questions. I would like to say prior to the questions, just one, one point. Um, there is a, the, the idea that of all of the people who are eligible in the age category to go to work, that we in the state, in the United States, it's not the same in, in Canada and it's not the same in other European countries uh, or in European countries, but in the United States, we have a decline of about 18% of participation in the workforce from 1949 to now. So what happened to all these people? Where did the workers go? In the state of Washington, only 60% of the eligible workers are actually in the workforce. It's not 4% unemployment, my friends. It's just not, it's far more than that. And you know, that, that, that's talking depression numbers. So we need to think about this because there are so many changes that are going on in technology and the way we do our work and there are a lot of people who certainly are not there. We need to reach out and figure out what we need to do, especially since we know we have all of these vacant, vacant spots, vacant jobs, job vacancies. So with that, let's have some questions. I think you were first and then you can be second. And John, you. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, very enjoyable and uh, very useful uh, presentations. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm a Consul General of Japan, but uh, my uh, question and uh, a little bit of remarks is uh, purely as a, as a person, you know. So it has nothing to do with the uh, Japanese government's, uh, you know, concern or, you know, position. Uh, the question is uh, a, um, about the ethics uh, of uh, technology. Uh, we have heard, uh, you know, throughout these uh, presentations, and I earlier uh, attended the uh, innovation. Uh, I heard a very little, uh, you know, uh, mention uh, to, uh, you know, ethical uh, implications of this very rapid uh, technology, uh, te technological uh, advance, advancement. And um, I, well, uh, all technologies uh, can be used for good, and uh, you have uh, largely uh, a, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 um, emphasized uh, the uh, you know positive aspects of technological advancements, but the uh, you know uh, drugs uh, can be used as uh, drugs, but it can be uh, you know very addictive. Uh, the guns uh, can be uh, used uh, to protect yourself, but can uh, kill others. And all uh, these uh, technologies uh, you know uh, can be for good and for worse. Uh, we now uh, see, uh, you know, a, uh, <clears throat> uh, a signs that uh, technology and uh, great uh, data processing uh, uh, is uh, used uh, uh, to control uh, humans by other humans. Uh, two days ago, uh, we saw, a, well, I read uh, an article uh, in which it said, uh, you know, uh, in China, uh, a criminal or, you know, somebody sought after was caught in a stadium. Uh, because of facial recognition. Okay, uh, from their uh, country's point of view, it may be good uh, for the uh, you know, um, maintenance of a social order, but do we actually want such a society where you know, your every move is uh, being uh, you know, uh, caught uh, you know, by the authorities? And uh, you know, the, uh, you know, in the li applied to life science, uh, we, uh, well, yesterday, I think, uh, it was uh, the 40th anniversary of the first ever woman uh, in Britain uh, that was born uh, by uh, artificial insemination. She's a mother of three children already. And just 40 years ago. But the, uh, I think we are on the verge of uh, producing uh, human clones. In a, a society like India or China, where the uh, boys uh, you know, uh, exceed uh, the number of uh, girls uh, by, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> by a ratio of uh, 20 percent or so. Are we going to produce, uh, you know, uh, women by uh, artif uh, not just artificial insemination, but by human clones? And uh, you know, uh, because uh, men uh, want uh, emotional or sexual, you know, partners, 
and how are we going to uh, you know, uh, educate uh, these girls. Uh, uh, that is going to be a real possibility in f even five or ten years' time. Do we want, have you read the, you know, uh, Aldous Huxley's a new, uh, brave, brave New World? Uh, it's uh, society, uh, they depict, uh, the book depicts a society where uh, that sort of thing is a, possi is a possibility. So, we have largely a, uh, <clears throat> uh, discussed the positive you know, uh, prospects, promises, and possibilities of a technological advancement. But uh, what about the uh, you know, negative side and how we are going to uh, constrain that? Uh, what are the ethical implications of this? I'd like to hear you know, a, uh, your opinions on that. This is a personal <laughs> uh, a statement and a personal question. Thank you. If, if I may take a stab at yes, that, please. I think in general, the answer to that question is probably a, a full day's worth of back and forth. But um, often, so I work in a lot of standards boards and we look at a lot of these type of questions. Uh, fundamentally though, uh, before we go into more of the bigger, bigger social issues, we just have to understand how the technology actually works, right? And where the domains that they play in. Because uh, some of these things, when you look at it from a high level, like anything is possible, it can, can seem very scary. But it's also, if you look at the stadium example of computer vision and recognizing that data source, um, it's, it's not hard to say then can you track everything in certain situations, but the reality of that is those databases of where that information actually lives is actually isolated. Um, and, and the more we understand more core functionality, how they integrate, none of this, a lot of the stuff we think about is actually not that new. Um, why, what I love about this conference is there's a lot of policy decision makers here that have, can leverage their, their best practice of how we've always looked at new technologies, new industries, and really kind of bring that to the forefront. So I don't think ethics is new in this conversation. We don't necessarily bring it up in that regard, but to really address that, I think we just have to understand how everything really works together and um, just have more open discussions before making a very strong decision of how to do one thing versus the other. As a uh, computer scientist and mathematician, um, that's what I studied in college, I um, want to make a plea for the liberal arts. I think part of, I mean, we talked a little bit about STEM, um, but I think we often overlook that, you know, um, the arts, novels, English, that's where we learn our ethics. That is um, what drives, you know, our judgment in that's integral to any technology and workforce conversation. So, <laughs> it, in Canada, we not, are not talking about STEAM, right? right? And I don't yeah. know, is that a common term in the U.S. as well? Yeah. Okay. Um. Hi. So, I, I'm just going to put my two cents in because I can't stop myself. But I, uh, I had read an article, and probably some of you had, about Amazon. And Amazon's coming to, to Spokane, as Alicia mentioned. And in the article, it mentioned that there was some sort of device that were on employees' hands, helping guide their hands more quickly to the products they needed to get those products off the shelves and into the conveyor belt faster. Did anyone else read this article? Raise your hand. Yeah. So it's already happening. It's already known. So your question might be, should we regulate that? Should we stop Amazon from doing that? Right? So I don't know the answer to the question, but it's, it's out. There's things like this. Obviously, they, there was an expose that someone wrote in Great Britain about Amazon. He posed as a regular Amazon worker, right? And, and just talked about how even going to the bathroom, how long did the employee go to the bathroom for? It's easy to monitor. So there's stuff happening in the workplace right now that we know about. So that's another question, not just the AI genie, the artificial intelligence genie once it's out of the bottle, and what will happen, but just what's happening currently. Okay, I think Lars had a question, Lucas. It, it's two questions, but I'm gonna see if I can squeeze it into one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it kind of goes to, uh, it kind of goes to, to government, so I, but I don't know if you want to take it from a government perspective or from private sector and kind of responding back. So one, uh, it was great you're talking about uh, workforce participation and unemployment rates. Uh, so right now, to the best of my knowledge, nowhere really in the country, it's that U6 standard of unemployment, that, that the true more correct standard of unemployment or employment, it's not available. So we can't even have a conversation about it. So, and the government refuses to fund that. And so I think one question goes to, um, if we want to have better data-informed conversations, what about correct 
active data, but then also you talked about uh, workforce uh, utilization rates uh, and participation rates. Uh, we don't necessarily even have those numbers because why aren't they participating? Are they able to participate in part-time or full-time employment for what reasons? Because uh, if we want to uh, provide in, uh, intervention, uh, who can we engage for what purpose for what industries? And I, well, I guess kind of, so like one is on the labor side, the other side is on this regulation that as we see technology coming in, that's great, that doesn't happen in a bubble. If Washington State or anything in each of our states or provinces, if we are, um, more, what will, dr what will make us uh, more vulnerable or less vulnerable to these changes if we tend to be a, uh, a high labor cost uh, center? Um, will we gain more economic impact, lose jobs? Like, do we have an idea of, of how regulations impact uh, the adoption of new technology, et cetera? Anybody on the panel? <laughs> So we talked, as you saw in the presentation, about this sort of the joblessness that's not part of the quote unemployment rate. I'm not exactly sure about the statistics and where that's coming, that, that labor force participation rate, but we know it's been going down, right? We know that especially male uh, working age participation is going down. It was sort of masked a little bit by female participation going up, right? We also, I think anecdotally, or at least I've read articles about 20 somethings uh, playing video games full time for reals, on their parents' couch. Um, so that's an untapped labor market, right? Maybe parents need to say, get off the couch, go get a job, yeah. We also know that the Great Recession really impacted folks if they, if they lost their job when they were middle-aged, if they were in their 40s or 50s, they weren't able to go back and get a replacement job after all of that, that paid the same wage, no matter how hard we try to retrain them, reskill them, right? And some of those folks, I think, just said, I give up. I'm going to go on disability, and they start, and so disability, right, we see the number of people getting disability checks has been going up. So we know there's some trends like that, but to your question about uh, how to re-engage some of those people, uh, how to get them back, it, it's not always clear. I definitely think that the young people should be, you know, go house to house and say, get off the couch. That's, that's, no. <laughs> Anyone else want to weigh in? I'm going to not answer the data question other than I think that the more data, I mean, the more we can figure out access to the data that actually tells us about who we're, who we're actually targeting, where they are, all of that. I mean, the more we're getting data, data smarter every single day, and what we find is that that helps us to be better at what we're doing. I think on the um, regulation piece, I mean, so who we are representing business, I mean, yes, you have to have regulation to a level, but we're in a global economy competing every day across our states and provinces and across the globe. And so we have to be really careful that our regulation doesn't continue to hold back the ability for the United States and our, and our private sector and our companies to compete. And I think that's, those are the conversations that we're having here and need to continue to have because it's happening. I mean, we were in a, Lars and I were both in a university roundtable conversation yesterday and to hear some of the things that are happening with students on campuses that aren't part of the private, I mean, it, that ta it's happening whether or not we're ready for it or not. And so how do we make sure we have the right regulation and the right boundaries around that, but at the same time not um, hold back our ability to compete? Let me just ask, ask a quick question on the source. If you, um, the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco is where I started getting the information. Uh, OEDC has done a lot of work. Uh, the um, uh, some of the, the, it's mainly at the economist level uh, in academic world, so, but I have a full bibliography that I'd be happy to share with you. Well, so I can, uh, that, that's my background. The, uh -huh. For the, un, like the underemployment that you six, it's only available at an annual rolling average, and it's not available at the local level. This is, this is information mm -hmm. that is not being tracked, is not being reported on. Well, I'll, I'll give you the bibliography, and I, there's, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Okay. okay. I want to add one last thing, sorry. I'm, I'm very interested in this topic. I work with folks at the Workforce Board who are researchers. I hope, and maybe I could, we can connect after this, but I'm, I'm fascinated by that because when they told me that they get unemployment statistics, I believe, through phone calls, how many people have landlines? How are they getting the phone numbers to call people on their <laughs> cell phone, right? So I, I question the statistics, sorry. Question one, the I, statistics. I, I question the statistics because I don't know how we're I'll getting. Give you the bibliography too. I'm going to have to read that. It better be good because nobody has landlines. 
left, yeah. Okay, any more questions from the audience? <coughs> I have a question for Vinay. So you talked a lot about um, you know, the advancement in technology, and that's one of the things that we, we see as a challenge as well, because we have this conversation today, and we might have this conversation next week, and it's totally different, right, because technology is advancing so quickly. So how are you, what do you see as the um, challenge or opportunity for training the aging workforce in how to use this technology that's becoming available? Because I won't even let my dad have a smartphone, right? Because I don't want to be his tech support, <laughs> my 85-year-old dad, right? So how are we going to be training people like myself who's you know, advancing in my career, getting ready to retire, but I still need to keep up with what's happening in the workforce. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, actually. We've tried to really address that in a couple of things. One, yeah, technology is changing pretty rapidly, but the solutions themselves don't really need to. Um, the, the most amazing thing about kind of where we're at, especially in the, the VR space, um, our kind of one of our platforms has been out for multiple years. So the same Vive you use today was actually launched five years ago, four years ago, in some form, it's the exact same platform. Um, the way these have been built have been built so that they don't change so ra or don't need to change so rapidly so they have longevity um, because it's meant to serve more of a purpose than entertainment. So part of that comes from also utilizing local communities. Uh, we actually have a program where we've leveraged libraries because so many community members actually use either the internet or those facilities on a consistent basis for access to that information. So, so partnering with local communities, local agencies with a solution really allows that consistency and accessibility that uh, then you don't have to worry about um, whether it's yourself or someone you need to support to now go into this thing that, you know, our phones, there was a time when we were replacing a phone every three months mm -hmm. and that was a big pain. But at least with these technologies, it's, it's, it's foundational so it doesn't have to change. And by partnering with kind of local governments and local communities and libraries, you're able to kind of build that consistency. Um, also, I, I think uh, the rise of AI helps in this domain a lot, in that the way we will be interacting with these technologies will become more natural. Um, uh, Alexa is kind of funny to use, but it took no time at all for my parents to pick it up. Um, and my daughter picked it up immediately. Well, <laughs> right. <kids. laughs> but um, the, you know, whereas you used to have to learn to, um, you know, write assembly language to do high-end graphics on the computer. Right. Now, a lot of that's packaged in a much easier format, so that's going to continue to develop, and, and the approachability of technology will improve. Okay, so the inside-the-box technology is going to change, and the user interface won't be as drastically changing exactly. as quickly. Yeah, and actually, foundationally, though, good uh, VR is just natural. So I use it a lot with my dad. He has a lot of uh, health issues in terms of exercising and stuff. So. He just puts on the VR headset and knows how to do everything on his own because it's, for example, um, like picking up a basketball, doing those things, there isn't, it's natural interfaces and that's what really VR ultimately is. It's a very natural, intuitive way to do things and so that's why companies are using it as kind of the next platform because you don't necessarily have to train someone how to use VR, right? So, so I think that okay. inherently is part of the platform. Good. Good. Any more questions from the audience before we wrap things up? Any closing comments, Senator? Pardon me? Do you have any closing okay. comments? All right. No? All right. Well, I would like to thank all of our, our panelists once more for coming out and joining us today. I, it was very entertaining and lots of good information there. So thank you for the effort and for joining us.